it's been an absolutely thrilling time to be in Scotland. I've sort of followed Scottish politics since my teens way back <clears throat> several decades ago, and I've never known anything like it. I've lived through three referenda on Scotland's constitutional position, and this one was different. And you will have seen, I think, probably the, the first of two remarkable results one remarkable result was that 45% of the Scottish electorate rejected a political union that has been for 307 years one of the most stable in the world. So a quite remarkable, although the result was a no, 45% of the electorate wanted a radical shift in that. The other one that's got a lot of coverage, but actually I think maybe short to longer term much more uh, significant, is the turnout. I mean, an unprecedented interest in Scottish people about the debate. In the 1970s, uh, uh, when uh, Scotland was talking about devolution, and in the 1990s, when people were talking about self-determination and devolution, many people, especially uh, on the Conservative Party, said, this is all kind of airy-fairy stuff. People don't really take this seriously. It's not important bread and butter issues. It's not what we hear on the doorsteps. What we hear about on the doorsteps is health, is education, is crime, is defence, is, 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 is all of these kind of things. And I think what's happened with this referendum is all of those doorstep issues, all of those bread and butter issues, were actually encapsulated in this campaign, such that as a, a, a nation, we were arguing about the best way to be governed and to meet our aspirations. And I think there's a legacy then of the referendum, of this massive uh, 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 democratic connection. Is the basis for Scotland's nationhood is not cultural, it's not language, it's not religion, it's not a sense uh, uh, of an ethnic identity, it's thoroughgoingly institutional. It is the institutions that Scots live their everyday lives through. And for most of its time in the Union, Scotland is largely left alone. Scotland largely runs its own affairs. And I think that's important when we look at the point at which Scotland starts to become troubled by the Union, this partnership. Really the point that Scotland becomes troubled by this partnership with England is the point where the Union starts to fail to deliver. Now we've heard much in the campaign uh, um, that can be a bit annoying, to be honest. The sort of metaphor of divorce, the metaphor of separation, the metaphor of splitting up. But if you'll forgive me for kind of running with that metaphor a little bit, 1707 was a marriage of convenience. It suited both sides. There wasn't that much love involved. But then marriages in the early 18th century were often like that for, for individuals. For much of the next 200 years, it's a very fruitful marriage. Not for the colonies, not for India, not for uh, places in Africa, but for Scotland and for England and for Wales. It's a very successful period of industrial revolution, of empire, etc. The Union delivers material goods to Scotland. Scotland is not a colony in this period, it's a coloniser. It's a partner with England in a grand uh, imperial project. Prior to the 1950s and 1960s, Scotland is no threat at all to the Union. Barely is the Union seriously questioned in Scotland. But by the 1960s, the Scottish National Party has gone from being very much a fringe uh, political player to being quite at the centre. Now, this is nothing to do with ethnicity. This is nothing to do with a rediscovery uh, of nationhood, for Scotland had never forgotten its nationhood. It was more to do with the decline of the United Kingdom as a successful state. And it's at this period that nationalism starts to take a much more political edge in Scotland. We can add into that um, British government shifting to the right, especially the Conservative Party, um, taking up policies that didn't fit Scotland's uh, uh, economic interests. And we can also add in North Sea oil. Suddenly, out there under the grey, boring North Sea was an alternative economic model, something a little bit different. So that's kind of where I think Scottish nationalism comes from and why it often seems quite odd to outsiders when it's not about culture, it's not about language, 
It's often about institutions that we so take for granted, we forget to tell you that that's what it's about. Both parts here agreed uh, that this referendum was legitimate. Uh, this means that uh, the debate uh, shifted uh, from uh, is it right for Scotland to vote uh, to is it good for Scotland to be an independent country and they have uh, to persuade especially labour supporters. The proposal was the so-called in the light that was presented by Alex Salmon and Nicola Sturgeon in the white paper. In the light means uh, we are going to be an independent country but we are going to keep uh, the Queen, the Pound and we are going to stay inside the European Union. Uh, in order to persuade these undecided voters, they used three main arguments. Uh, one was, we have a democratic deficit. The second one was, we care about welfare. And the third one was, Divomax is not an option. But they still had two unaddressed issues. One was the gender gap. Many women baking no, and they didn't solve that. They tried so hard with this committee, Women for Independence, uh, but actually they didn't and one other was the age gap with many people old people uh, back in no uh, this one i think was uh, one of the main causes of uh, the fact that they didn't win because uh, since 75 percent of people over uh, 65 years uh, voted no plus they had the SNP leading the campaign with this strong leadership uh, Alex, uh, Alex Salmon and Nicola Sturgeon are uh, still considered uh, credible <coughs> and they were very active, travelling everywhere, uh, every day, everywhere. And many people trusted them in defending Scotland's interests, even people from the north. As we can see from this poll, uh, Alex Salmon and Nicola Sturgeon are the most uh, trusted in, in stand up for <coughs> Scotland interests while David Cameron and Alistair Darling did not perform so well. Um, for the people who are voting no, six out of ten of them, so 60% of them, were motivated by the fear of the future if there was going to be an independent Scotland. On the other hand, when it looked at people voting yes, eight out of ten people voting yes were motivated by hope for the future. Um, and this was very much reflected, many have accepted, even on the no side, in the actual campaigns. In, in, in the yes campaign, we've seen a very positive vision of Scotland in the no campaign. A lot of it did have to do with scaremongering about fear of the risks of what would happen if we left the Union. So the big issues here for people voting no were initially the, the currency. Um, would we keep the pound? Wouldn't we? Would we join the euro? What would happen with EU membership? But in particular about um, risk to personal finances, their salaries, their mortgages, their pensions, what, what would happen in, in these cases? Um, so is it really down to the economy? Um, well, um, arguably, yes, a lot of it does have to do with the economy. Some um, polls have shown that this is the number one factor motivating the no voters, their fears about the economy. Um, and as Paola said, um, and I was, I'll maybe say a bit later, and um, perhaps the Yes campaign didn't do enough to address some of those fears. Number one headline banner I would say to, to nationalist parties everywhere is that Scotland has provided a very nice model of how to include ethnic minorities and immigrants. That has been absolutely fundamental for the SNP to be perceived as a legitimate independence seeking movement. As Michael said, nationalism in Scotland has not been galvanised by cultural claims, by claims to have an essential culture, by claims to ethnicity, by claims to language or religion. It's been based on institutional identity, it's been based on political and economic demands as well. And in fact, the SNP have um, articulated a very multicultural vision of Scotland. So we've seen the creation of Asians for independence, Italians for yes, I, uh, I saw on Facebook a little while ago, English for yes as well. So it has been an inclusive um, civic nationalism. All of its opponents haven't questioned that and have respected that, in fact. I like to call Sardinia the Mediterranean Scotland. Okay? <laughs> we both have a strong sense of identity, as, um, as Michael showed earlier. In fact, Sardinia has a slightly stronger Sardinian identity than Scotland has a Scottish identity.
And we both have mature nationalist movements that have been around since the 1920s, 1930s. Mm. Another difference that I didn't put up there is the way our autonomies developed. So we got devolution in uh, 1997 to 1999 after a couple of decades of campaigning for a Scottish Parliament. Scots drew up the blueprint for the Scottish Parliament, including civic society, including all the political parties. Sardinia, on the other hand, got their um, special statute in the Italian constitution in 1948. They didn't draw it up. It was imposed, basically, from Italy. It was based on the Sicilian model. That was due to disagreements within the Sardinian um, parties at the time. But for many people in, in Sardinia, autonomy is a, a dirty word, right? And that's because autonomy for the last 60 years has masked two things. It's masked an economic dependence on Rome is also masked various forms of political patronage between um, Sardinian political parties and, and Roman political parties as well. So if you talk about autonomy in Sardinia, um, you might get some nasty looks and therefore there has been moves to other constitutional um, options, move from federalism and as we know from um, progress, independence as well and that seems to be a radically, radicalization of demands towards independence not just in Sardinia but in many other stateless nations as well. It's important to acknowledge that the SNP has moved from being an ideology light party that was a broad church that was very much identity driven in its early stages to being very much a class-based party that had a clear social democratic agenda from the 1990s. That, that, was, that was really the SNP success. And it's also very much reflected in, the, in the, the results a couple of days ago. So people voting yes, Scottish identity was not at the top of their list of concerns. It was opposition to Westminster policies. It was class policies, it was political policies. On the other hand, people voting no Identity did matter. Britishness was actually one of the main reasons why people voted no. So actually when the SNP, the Yes group, were talking about a, a social movement, a multicultural social movement, but not talking about Scottish identity, the, the parties, the pro-UK parties, were talking about identity. In Sardinia, many of the parties are still very much identity-based, rather than having a strong ideological position. Um, and I, I think that that's something that that needs to develop more. And I, I know some of the parties in um, Sardinia have been opposed to the Partito Sardinazione and Sardinia Nazione saying, oh, we don't have an ideology on the class issue, we just have an ideology on the identity issue. And have had more social democratic um, um, aspects to the, to the parties. I think that is a sign of maturity, but it's also an acknowledgement that you can't win the arguments for self-determination on identity alone. You also have to take a strong stance on what kind of vision um, of society you want on issues of welfare, of the economy, of, of development, of the environment. And I think a lot of the Sardinian parties now are doing that. Quite clearly, there was a class difference in how people voted uh, on Thursday. It's not absolute, it's not determining, but it was very, very clear indeed that people from the least privileged class backgrounds in Scotland, people from the poorest places were voting yes, and people in uh, the most privileged places were voting no. Well, possibly, possibly sense they had more to lose um, because they had more to lose. Um, and those with, with less to lose or, or those who felt that um, the existing conditions of power, I, I don't want to bang that drum too much, we're, we're, we're not helping them, we're not delivering them, and that something had to change. Now, that might not necessarily be a, a nationalistic something, but a sort of sense that the UK is not working. Thank you. Thank you.